something called Anthem Worldwide. I'm Gretchen Grant, and I'm general manager of BobVilla.com, the home improvement website. My name is Brian Halvey, I'm the executive creative director for the interactive practice at, at G2, which uh, some of you know is there's a million G2s out there. There's really about five practices of directing visual, branding, healthcare, and, and interactive. Um, so I'm leading up the interactive uh, department in G2 here in New York and Pennsylvania. Cool, thank you. We're so happy to have you all. All right, well. I guess we're just going to dive, well actually, sorry, we, we like to ask an icebreaker question uh, to start. So uh, the, the icebreaker is, when did you like first know that you were a creative person? Like, what was your first uh, experience? <laughs> Brian, we'll start, we'll start with you and then we'll go this way, just to switch it up. <laughs> <clears throat> well, when, ever since I grew up, I was a kid with the crayons and, uh, and watercolors. Mm -hmm. Doing the same thing with my children. You know, as soon as uh, they can put something in their hands. Um, so my, is my it an iPad in their case? Or is it an iPad in their case? For sure. For sure. Yeah. All right. It took me a longer path to figure out that I could comfortably call myself a creative. Um, business wise, I started out in finance, financial planning, and then morphed into business development, and from there left into general management a few years ago at um, Meredith Interactive, where I was being at parents.com and some of the other websites. So along that way, I did come to feel like I was very much a creative, and uh, there was one story that does come back to mind when I was at Viacom, which is prior to my Meredith experience, and at that time I was in this early phase of um, being a financial, actually I'd just gone from financial planning into business development, and uh, <coughs> Nickelodeon movies. So I was doing a business plan for Nickelodeon movies before I had really done any of the Rugrats movies or other things that may have been helpful and enjoyed. So one day the marketing director who had been hired from Disney and was coming from Los Angeles said to me, you know, you just don't dress like a finance person. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's right, I don't. Glad of it. And so there was the something in me that was coming out. And what, what, what I can now put into words is that I really believe that my reason that for is innovation and creativity, and I believe business is a tool to make innovation happen. And I love to bring together creativity and business in order for innovation to come to light. Great. Tara? Um, I, I was always a bit of a performer as a kid, but I think when I first realized that I was creative was when I was watching E.T. Because I, I was, that's the first time I remembered being completely immersed in in a creative product and um, I was completely overwhelmed by the story and by the visuals and by the, the technical aspects and and I really wanted to to be able to take that and and create the, <coughs> excuse me, create something that compelling someday in my life um, and I think that when I started playing video games um, <laughs> it, it, uh, and I've never been a big gamer but but what really got me were the, the um, story-based games, like Sierra and then King's Quest, things like that. And, and really, Monkey Island is the one that really captured me because it had a sense of humor. And, and that was really interactive storytelling for me, you know, back in like the late 80s, early 90s. And, and so from that point, I, I realized that I, I had to be a storyteller on some level and that technology would help me do it in a truly interactive way. Maybe it was self-fulfilling prophecy or something. And everyone said, "Oh, Emily, she's so creative." <laughs> so I wonder, like, what what with everyone else, you know? But <laughs> but I, I think that kids are all creative, you know, when they they're small. And um, and I fought it for a long time, you know. I was, I, I was brought to to art classes and this and that and, and kind of theater and um, and I sort of. Was was at odds, you know. My parents said, "Well, you know, go to go draw and, and everything." And I said, "No, I can't. I can do math, like my sister, or you know, or, or something else." But I, I couldn't really fight it. So um, you're right. That's where I am. Well, looking back, uh, I think I spent a long time uh, on school projects talking about and being very upset that Letter said only had old old English font. <laughs> but, um, that, was, that wasn't the thing. I didn't know at the time why I was really upset. Or I spent 
one time shaking the whatever the Jaguar. <laughs> the now was when I was uh, buying music solely for um, the covers before AD labels, before I was able to work. I was like, well, that's not good enough. So I'm like that. So it was kind of bananas. So your discerning eye at a very young age. Oh, very cool indeed. All right, so now we'll ask a tougher question. So we've got you creatives in the room. So how are you guys using the new digital technologies when you're creating your new campaigns? Can you just Anyway, yeah. Jump in. Jump in. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think it's, it's a process. Whatever the technology is, you, you don't want to force technology into a project, but uh, there's certainly a time you want to. I think new technologies are new and shiny, but there's always a use for an old technology, a new use for old technology. I think that is also a, a, a viable creative option as well. So, how do you use them? You want specific projects? Sure. Uh, and then are you are you thinking creatively first, and then going to the tools later, well, yeah, or the tools sort of dictating? Um, a couple of years, three years ago, we have a, a client phone. We got an indestructible phone, and we thought it wouldn't be good to you know bash this phone twenty four seven on a live webcam. So we got an engineer to construct a machine and just hammer this phone, and people would guess how many hits it would take to break the phone. So, and that was a live streaming thing. So they guessed and they got everything done. <laughs> so, kind of ideas, needs, and then how can you get it for Kind of going hand in hand. And anyone else? Yeah, I think for me, I, the, the way that I try to approach it is um, kind of strategy, then creative, and then you figure out your tactics. And, and so the technology, um, the technology is the place you want to go first because it's exciting and it's interesting and it's what everybody's talking about at any given moment. But um, I, I think that it's really important to sit down and think about what your goals are first and what your client's goals are first. I mean, it, there are there are so many times when you know um, I've had I've had people come to me and say, you know, what's our five years ago is what's our MySpace strategy, you know, and so now it's now it's you know. What is my iPhone app going to look like? And, you know, there has to be a mock-up of an iPhone in every pitch you do. But, you know, do you really need an iPhone app if you're, you know, selling car insurance online? I mean, you know, like maybe, you know, maybe that's probably not a good example. But, um, but, but, you know, I think that if you if you if you really nail down your goals and know who your audience is, who you're talking to. And it's a lot easier to figure out what they're already using, what they might have an appetite to use, and, and be able to choose the right tactics, the right technology to actually accomplish those goals in a really creative way. Great. Well, um, Brian. No, I agree. It all comes down to relevancy. It's, you don't want to uh, fit a square peg into a round hole. And the shiny objects are out there plenty right now. And believe me, we're all dying with the experiment and to sell those into our clients. It all comes down to relevancy. In, in, in to your point, strategically, me and the business objectives we're in. At the end of the day, we're marketers, right? So my boss is really happy to hear me say this. My creators are, you know, currently not right now. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, we're selling. We're selling things. It's about increasing share of wallets. It's about moving widgets off the shelf. What we're creating, what we're using, whatever technology it is, old or new, is it fulfilling business objectives? Well, I think it sort of ask, ask, uh, answers our second question, but we'll kind of ask it anyway. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing with using this new technology? Is it really just this client relationship, or are there some other challenges that you're facing with, with new technologies and using them as part of the creative process? Huge. Huge. <laughs> Huge. <laughs> Please share. I, I like to say, um, we present things to clients all the time, right? When we pitch, when we go blue ocean, when we go big sky. And they hire us based upon our thinking when it comes to actually executing stuff. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a minute here. Is that, how, how, how proven is that? How measurable is that? How many people have done that before? It's all about the four letter word risk. And that's when I remind them, well, there's another four letter word for you. It's safe. <laughs> keep, keep playing it safe and, and you're not going to get to the ultimate three letter word, which is win. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of be first, be first, be first out there, but there's a lot of, a lot of hesitation. And especially after the economic collapse, 
it was very, very hesitant to risk in some dollars on unknown technologies or unproven. I'll kind of amplify on that from an operating perspective. And like the folks here, I'm kind of on the client side, if you will, at uh, com. And so when I hear about new things, and I love new technologies, I know the ideas just kind of immediately spark. But I have to think about things like the time that it will take operationally to implement a new technology. My business goal right now, number one, increasing traffic to the site and engagement is pretty unique. So I think about is, is this new thing that you could do once you're out of video, um, well, it's pretty cool and we might get some good press out of it, but is it really going to get people in the front door? Because that's, I'm, I'm in the front door phase right now. And so I might offer a more plain vanilla tactic because I'm really thinking about that business objective and then six months down the road or X months down the road when I can think more about enriching and varying the user experience on the site, then I might be more in the market for some of those nifty ideas. So those are some of the considerations um, between strategy and operations that I have to keep in mind on new technologies. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, we work with a number of Pepsi brands and, and they've actually done a really, they're, they're like the best client to have because they're really experimental, but they're also a big, smart corporation that um, is not necessarily in first place in all of their categories. And so they, they need to think about, you know, how are we going to move the needle, but be experimental and get people to take notice. And so they, they're, they're really open to us bringing them innovative ideas and new technologies and, and new, new apps and different things we can try and just being experimental with some risk, but managed risk, you know, and um, for example, I don't know if you guys are aware, but at South by Southwest, they just did this, this campaign with Instagram, which is, you know, the hot new app baby of, of the world, which, you know, everybody's loving and everybody's talking about and everything. It's a great app. Um, but, you know, it could have been, it could have been like, okay, so they're partnering with the app that everybody's talking about, but they, they made a campaign with Brisk, um, which was, really spot on for their audience. They, they've built this audience on Facebook and on Twitter that's really responsive and, and likes to interact with them and is kind of snarky and, and likes to put sort of their own voices and faces out. And so they created this great thing where with Instagram, you could get your face put onto a can of risk. I mean, that's pretty cool, you know? And, and, that, and that brings it, that crosses over from, from the online world to the offline world, you know? And doing things like that, you know, really, um, helps to prove uh, in our space to many other clients, you know, like if you think it through and, and you do this in a smart way, then, you know, it's really possible to, to chase some of those shiny objects when they're relevant to your business objectives. Any other challenges down there or are you saving it? <laughs> um, even the minute challenge of trying to get a, something in a Facebook tab to work is because recently they, they were changing the model and what they were allowing to use. So you build out stuff, but they change it on the fly and with no warning. Mm -hmm. um, and that caused a lot of frustration. It's not as pleasant as getting a face on a can, but it's, it's a frustration. It's a new technology. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a new. Definitely. Oh, they're changing things, you know, every week, and it's very it's hard, hard to keep up when you're when you're talking to clients. And well, every new technology, you know, first starts in the hands of the engineers before it gets to the the creators or the content providers. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's always that that moment where it, it crosses over. You know, think about early film. You know, which uh, which was wild and new and shocking. I mean, you know, is this train coming at me? This thing that's that's moving. You know, because we ran out of the movie theater. You know, first <laughs> first films that were that were seen. You know, so there's a there's a big challenge to to saying, okay, there's this new thing and it can do X Y Z. You know, but to um, to one be able to implement it. You know, how easy is that? You know, from the engineering point of view. You know, how costly is it from the uh, you know to um, whether it's valuable, you know, and then does it does it enhance the message that that I'm giving, you know, or is it just something shiny new that everybody forgets when when it's like film now that you don't think it's magic anymore? And I think there's also a burden on us as the digital folks to, uh, you know, there there are less and less agency of record, you know, appointments being awarded, and so you know we're on we're on client teams of six different agencies sometimes and. And you know you cooperate, and you want to cooperate, and you're all working towards the same goal of making your your client really happy. Um, 
And, and I think one of the most important things is that because in digital we're often um, carrying the, the burden of sustaining the communications on a much longer term basis, you know, there, there's the flight of um, interactive advertising, you know, TV spots and print ads and things like that, but that, that usually has a pretty short time because it's expensive. And, and so we're carrying, you know, social media and, and sort of the ongoing communications and, and that ongoing sort of flashiness that keeps bringing people back. And so it's our job to make sure that that keeps connecting back to the traditional media and that it connects back to the basic brand ethic that, you know, the brand development team came up with a year and a half ago and did focus groups on and proved that, you know, this is what's going to really sell product mm -hmm. and, and not just doing a digital tactic because it's interesting or because that's what the trend is right now. Yeah, and to keep it fresh for that long a period of time also. Absolutely. Cool. So I guess our next question is, in terms of your clients, now they get shiny object syndrome. Are they coming to you and saying, oh, I saw Instagram, we must use it now, or is it more about they just hear about these great technologies and they're demanding that you guys use them now. Is that happening? Are you guys doing the education or are they uh, just forcing it on you? Yeah. I wish they were. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody wants social now. Everybody wants mobile now. That's that's the, the new thing. And even to your point, do they need it? Whether they need it or not, they don't know. Uh, I think that that's a big part of our job is to guide them through this ever-changing landscape, this digital landscape, like, here's what you need. I want to build you an augmented reality app, believe me, but it's not right now. <laughs> it's not the right time. You'll just be wasting your money. So it's something that that's a, that's a big part of our job is to educate them and guide them through that landscape about what's relevant, what, mm -hmm. what can help them in the here and now. And what we build, kind of playing off what you said here, it's about sustainability, too. If I build something, we always need to have a back door open so we can go in and, and fix it, like reinventing the wheel. It's, the Facebook is changing their specs all the time, or the, the mobile application is now different, or the cell phone care has, has new uh, standards, etc. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, I think that you make a great point because um, <laughs> I think clients are coming to us and, and they're saying, I want this, but they don't really know what they want. And usually they're coming and saying, we need social media or we need mobile, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so broad and they don't even really know what that means. And so then you go, you go into education mode. And if you're not an agency of record, you're doing a whole lot of education for free or for potential money. You know, these are project based things. And so, so what we have to do is we have to get really strategic about um, kind of just knowing the space at any given time and and really uh, being ready with materials and with knowledge to share and package up for our clients at any given time. And, you know, one of the ways we've answered that is is we do these eight-week deep dives into areas of the industry. So right now we're in, we're in the midst of apps. You know, um, that seems incredibly broad, but, you know, we're, we're dealing with closed apps like the Daily and we're dealing with app stores and sort of various aspects of it. So we have a speaker come in every week for six weeks and then we do um, an internal sort of recap of everything we just learned. And then our last week, we break out into client teams and brainstorm based on everything we just learned, specific ideas for our existing clients. And, and it's actually been really incredible because what comes out of that, we try to, we don't always accomplish this, but we try to come out of it with, you know, at least a short deck, at least a short presentation that we can then go and kind of do a roadshow if we need to for mm -hmm. our clients and say, hey, here's, here's the state of the art on apps right now, you know. And, and we obviously choose these topics pretty uh, tactically so that, um, so that we know that we're choosing, you know, a lot of retail if we're doing a lot of CPG and, and things like that so that we're, we're sort of prepared for those conversations. You're this is all in turn. We we do it within our agency. <laughs> it's out of you know bettering our agency and and out of it we try to create the onus to to create something packaged that we can bring to our clients. So your creative process is now actually educating yourselves on all of this new technology. 
and then thinking about how you're going to educate your client after the fact. Totally. I mean, we, we kind of need to do that. Yeah, anyway. and it's great for morale too. I mean, everybody loves to you know take an hour and and listen to you know the the founder of Zynga talk about social gaming, you know, and, yeah. and hear about their growth and what they're doing. And it's it's not only educational; it's also a great relationship builder for us. Because if we actually sell that through to the client, it's, we want to have that relationship in place before exactly. <laughs> we say, yeah, exactly. go do it. And then we have to figure out how we're going to call it. Who's going to make the next phone call? We swear. Yeah. Wait. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, you know, it's, it's thought through on, on a number of different levels. You've got to build the relationship. You've got to build the knowledge. And you have to be ready to have those conversations with your client without doing all that work in a reactionary way. Mm -hmm. Cool. So do you guys think that design uh, still matters <laughs> in the digital age? Uh, you're obviously, most of you are creative people. That's why, you know, you got into what you're doing. So, so kind of, does design matter more or less? Are you fighting design with the technology or how's it? How's I think it matters it? more than ever because I think design is both ease or experience part and also look and feel. And so look and feel is, critical because it's a way of sending out amidst the crowded you know, landscape of websites and all the different things you can do on the web. And user experience is critical because things can be so much more involved uh, now. You know, what do I do on my Facebook page? What do I do with this video app? I mean, the online experiences can be so uh, multifaceted and rich that how you lead the consumer through them has to be so super clear. I mean, I know we all know that, but but I think for that reason, really paying attention to how you move people through a website or through a particular feature and making it attractive enough for them to try in the first place. All that to me is design more important than ever. Absolutely. You're looking at campaigns now that get launched. They're not just about a TV ad or a radio ad. They go through multiple touch points, multiple touch points, multiple channels. There needs to be unification across all of those channels. So how many times have you seen that? A TV ad, then you walk into a store and you see the hang tag on the clothing that you saw commercial for. It's totally different. And you see an, an online ad, you know, there's just it's it's all over the place. It's scatterbrained. There's no unification, uh, and it makes such a big difference when there is unification. It really does say a lot about how you care about the brand and how you care about your consumer because you want them to look at look at this and feel familiar. You want them to figure oh, this is intuitive. I recognize this, and especially with digital. Digital is so complex. It can be very, very simple, but it can also peel back many, many layers of an onion. It can get extremely complex, and design is so, so important to help guide them, to make them feel comfortable, to find that intuitive nature with simple as uh, interactive el interaction elements or navigation elements. If it's on an iPhone, an iPad, a website, you want there to be familiar, you know, familiar uh, interactive elements and navigation elements. It, uh, as that world has grown and it's so ubiquitous now. It's like it touches every channel. Visual does. Uh, design is of the utmost importance. I completely agree. I mean, I, I'm actually not a designer. I'm, I came into the creative much more from like the video and storytelling and interactive side of things. And um, so I have the ultimate respect for people like you who can actually do it, you know. But for me, more as a user, in fact, like, I, I mean, I'm really big on apps. And so for me, it's all about user interface. It's about user experience, you know. And and I will delete an app two seconds after I open it if I can't figure out what to do or what its reason for being is. You know, there's a little bit more tolerance on a website, you know. But but I think that there's so much noise out there right now, and and we're all so just overwhelmed with information and with options that you know if you're looking at kind of a grid of apps in the app store, you know, <coughs> just thumbnail, where you're looking at, you know, any other <coughs> design where you're trying to decide what to pay attention to, I think that the well-designed thing that is effective for whatever that context is that you're in at that moment, that's what's going to, you know, compel you to, to engage with it. So, I mean, I think that all comes down to design. Uh, I just to reiterate, I always found that um, my space, uh, demise is politicized with design. Mm -hmm. Life was never so damn chaotic as keep on going. Um, and we're doing, yeah, instead of all, you know, other universes, MySpace, which, I mean, Facebook, yeah. which is so clinical and clean and regular, people then start using it the same way they use Google. They use it blindly. Mm -hmm. They start focusing on content, and then mm -hmm. there's a success of user interaction. And that those levels of design 
which never were there, are now there. That must include because of the changes to red, people freaked out, so, you know, get lost. That good design. It's so good, we don't even know that it's but there. It's just it's so programmed to understand. Yeah. It's the, the Uber design. <laughs> Sarah, you were touched upon something that's about most importance and it needs to be reiterated, is that design is not just about the final pixel. It's not about this beautiful layout, right? How many times have we seen a really beautiful app, really nicely designed, but the user interface, the user experience absolutely sucks. And it just ruins it. It just ruins it. So nice pixel pushing, nice creative, but the experience is horrible. So that is that needs to be hand in hand to design the user experience in the, the creative design space. It can also be the opposite though. That yeah, you have a absolutely. you've got a great user experience, but the but it looks ugly. You know, and and you get okay, Craigslist. <laughs> that won't sell. You know, we're we're bombarded with with so much stuff. You know, that we we can choose. You know, what we think is beautiful to surround ourselves with. You know, so that's also important. So, Emily, we've got a question for you. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> tell us how Open Info works. Okay, so. Um, Okay, maybe I'll tell you a little bit of a, a story how it was how it was born. Um, I, I had this problem. I had I had too many ideas for for new products and, and services, and uh, and I kept saying, well, you know, there should be something that does this or or that. And everyone said, that's great. You know, we need that. You know, why don't you do that business? And I said, I don't want to be the owner of that business. I was I was working as a as an artist and and an academic. I I taught in a, a cultural theory program. And, um, uh, and I said, we'll, we'll do that. And I said, well, can I, can I make some money off of my ideas without um, actually doing them? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and then I, I found that I, I, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I, That's for you. <laughs> it, it really sucked. So there I was, you know, starving artist and, and academic. And then my, my now co-founder, he said to me, let's have a business out of selling ideas. And I said, that can't be done. And, uh, and now, uh, a couple of years later, I, I have a business that's based on, on selling ideas. So, um, so it, it, it took a lot of talking to intellectual property attorneys and a lot of research in, in, into companies and what they're looking for in terms of, of innovation. And I could, I could say that uh, Open Info is like Kickstarter, but if you don't want to do the project yourself. Mm -hmm. You know that's uh, that's that's one part of it. You know, or it's it's almost like get money for your ideas, but actually you do get the money, unlike a lot of those those companies. So so basically, if you've got a new idea for a product or service, uh, you can upload it to the Open Invo website for free. Uh, you can upload drawings and, and video. You know, you have to do a little bit of strategy and answer some some questions about it. And then on the other side, the idea of seekers, uh, we target um, uh, innovation departments and R&D departments of large corporations that are looking for ideas from outside sources, kind of fresh ideas uh, from, from, hence Open Invo is the, the name, uh, Open Innovation is the, is the model um, where companies are looking for ideas from outside sources. So when we make a match, uh, then, uh, then we help you uh, sell or license the IP you, you, for you, and we take a small commission. Any great ideas out there? You all know who to talk to uh, afterwards. <laughs> you guys have all been very quiet. Now, how come there's no questions? Feel free to jump on in. How often do people post their idea and then find their idea someplace else? Right, so so we worked really hard on uh, on doing all the intellectual property that's that's there. Uh, we're we're new, I should say that we just launched this this fall, and uh, and so we're really trying to get the word out to, to people with with great ideas right right now. Um, uh, what we've done is that you decide how much uh, protection you want, how much privacy you want on that idea your, yourself. So, uh, so if you want the idea provider community to see it, you know, maybe you're looking for a collaborator, you can put that out there and it's, it's open. If it's something that you want the world to see, you know, because it would be great, you know, if, uh, uh, if there was peace, love, and, uh, you know, and, and green energy, yeah, exactly, then, uh, then you can have it that way also. If it's something really great and it's going to, you know, make you millions of dollars, you can keep it totally private. We only show it to people that we have a contract with that we track on the on the back end. So all that stuff is is in there, and we don't have any exclusivity. 
you can, you know, put it on Facebook if you want and also have it through our website. Do you have any success stories yet? So, so not from the platform itself. Uh, some things that uh, that we kind of. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, I didn't. I didn't like that. Not from the platform it, itself because we're we're so new. But uh, but there have been some things that have been hand delivered to us that uh, that we've brought to to companies, um, which uh, which is really exciting and and more is happening all the time. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I want to bring back the challenge. So I know um, during the earlier discussion, um, a lot of the, the answers to that question revolved around um, expectations and things about their clients. So is there something you can talk about in regards to consumer adoption of like a very innovative idea and how it's overcome? I can address that. Um, yeah, I think QR codes are the perfect example of that. <laughs> we were just talking about it before as we were getting ready for the panel. I mean, I think that, you know, functionally, QR codes are the most amazing technology. I mean, all you have to do is take a picture and, and, and whatever the, the creator of that code wants you to do happens. You know, like you can, you can be sent to a website, you can receive a text message, like whatever you want, you put into that code. It's incredible. But the adoption rate is so tiny. And, and so, you know, uh, that's one of the things that a lot of retail clients are coming and saying, should we put QR codes on every box, you know, or should we, should we put them, you know, on our signage at events and things like that? And, and so we're, we're being really kind of selective about, about when we say yes. And, and um, for example, you know, we had a, an event at South by Southwest for a week for one of our clients. Lipton had a, had a tent there. Um, and and so we decided that you know this is an early adopter community and um, and also it's a captive audience with brand <laughs> ambassadors standing there you know talking to people and they can teach them how to use it and and these are you know influencers in this community having a good time drinking some drinks that we were putting together for them and everything this is a great opportunity to help sort of spread the gospel of QR codes and show them something cool and hopefully get them to go to the Facebook page and like it through this QR code. You know, so like there are multiple benefits there. But you know, putting it on packaging right now, like halting your production flow and and you know putting it on a box or something like that, it just doesn't make sense. You know, you look at South Korea, you look at Japan, and it's really exciting the level of adoption with all mobile technologies. You know, digital wallets and payments and everything. But we're just not there yet. So, you know, I think that. Um, Doing doing that experimental kind of activity, you know, in, in sort of um, controlled environments where you can guide the uninitiated in how to adopt this it can help, and and that can you know go viral, that can spread um, organically if if you do it in the right way. But if you just like force it on people, then you know people will be like, well, why are all the packages getting so ugly? You know, why do they have these things on here that I don't understand? And, what, what do they want me to do? Do you think some of that's also what's behind the QR code? I mean, QR codes definitely, it's something we talk about a ton, oh, so you sort of picked the sweet spot for us, but like, I mean, I personally think a lot of it is what you're finding once you actually make the effort to yeah, actually, you know, go through it with it, yeah. even. We, we, um, we recently did a study ourselves um, at a photo wine event. Um, we had 12 wine photos and wine sponsor, which means technology, which is people working in the wine industry that are and technology industry. So we thought it was ideal opportunity to test a technology mm -hmm. that they so called deem you know, a favor. And we had 11 bottles of wine and 12 bottles of mystery wine with a QR code. Um, 200 users, uh, I think we had 14% scanning the code, and then a single click to report page was registered to, sign, to win a, a dinner at Azure. And that was filled out to 6%. So there was, there were a couple of things you can learn about a QR code. People want at a, a time sensitive event, they're not going to scan. Mm -hmm. um, and then also that interaction, and then a double interaction at a time away for them. So there's a way you can snatch and go. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a win. And also you're saying, what, what is the content behind it? People were a little bit curious. The first thing, it was a mystery wine. Mm -hmm. I don't know what this is. 
Um, whereas the, the QR code billboard as in Tom Klein ran in Houston was probably successful because it knew exactly what you were going to get. Mm -hmm. So you went the extra mile to see that sexy video. video. <laughs> well, it's Calvin Klein. So you know. <laughs> and we just released, we do a, a social edition email every two weeks and we've just done that before. So if you want to check it out on Creative Feed. CreativeFeed.net, check out the QR code report. <laughs> hey, you know, I think the real direct answer to your question though, like how do you can how can we make it easy for consumers to adopt a new technology is in itself make it simple and make it relevant for them. Make it the information that they get relevant and make it simple. Now the reason why we're not doing such a good job of that here in the United States isn't because the process isn't simple. It's not built within into the infrastructure of the mobile phone. In Asia, when you buy a mobile phone, there's like a reader already in it. Right. You're done. Yeah. Remember when Flash first came out? I have to download the plugin. What? Uh, no, it's just it comes with. It's built in. Everybody experiences Flash because it's simple. It's not, you. You don't have to do anything. And the information and the visual displays and etc. Are, are they, they don't necessarily need to be relevant. But uh, the the information that you're seeking out, that you're opting into, is is relevant. So it's all about simplicity. And Apple's so damn good at doing that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know I needed this thing. No, I can't live without that. <laughs> I mean, they, they help you with this. It's just so unbelievably simple that you're like, oh, how could I have not used it before? And it's so inextricably bound to their store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to use iTunes. Well, it's I mean, not, it's just, you know, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I tried to use a Blackberry for a day after having an iPhone for the last four years, and literally I was like, I was a toddler. I couldn't like figure out how to use the keys. <laughs> Even the space bar seemed crazy to me. I was like, get this thing away from me. Where's my iPhone? And it's nuts because like we've all sort of become like slaves to Apple. <laughs> Apple touch screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, this actually could lead into our next question. Uh, so what are some great examples of create of innovation done done right and what are some examples of it done wrong? So can answer either right, right or wrong. And names can be changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> if you talk about your own work or other people's work, feel free. Whoever wants to jump in. So, um, so I met this 19 year old at South by Southwest. <laughs> he, he just launched his second company. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, these are the kind of things that just make you feel like, you know, why don't I just go make tacos? <laughs> really, like, uh, anyway, brilliant guy, Brian, Brian Wong, um, and and he just launched his company, which is called Keep. It's K I I P. I encourage you all to check it out. Um, it's it's a, a new approach to social gaming, and and I think what's really interesting is that he's he's thought very carefully about the emotional state of people as they play games. And what he's doing is he's giving brand rewards when people get achievements in games. So you reach a certain level, you, <coughs> you know, beat the boss, whatever, um, you beat your friend if you know it's a head-to-head -head type thing and you get a reward from a client from a brand and and you know in an ideal world that's a reward that is hopefully contextually relevant and and makes sense for that demographic, you know. So I think that's that's brilliant. And the other one that I'd like to mention is um, I, I think that uh, what's happening with photography right now is really interesting. And and it kind of answers both sides of the question because I think that there is just such a massive amount of photo apps right now, photo sharing apps. And so some people are doing it really well and some people are doing it really badly. Um, you know, you, there are a bunch of people just jumping on the train and like, here's a new way to share a photo. But I think what's really interesting is um, are, are the people like uh, food spotting and, and the ones that kind of take a a um, curation angle to it. It's it's like I'm really passionate about something in the world that I want to document, and so here's a community for that. But we'll let you share it with anyone. You can check in on Foursquare. You can post it to Facebook. You can post it to Twitter, etc. I, I think that 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 angle is a lot more important than just being able to like put you know, one of 20 filters on your photo. Um, I think I think that's the kind of thing that adds value because it adds to your own personal story. Cool. Cool. Anyone else seeing anything creative? Um, I'm thinking a lot about video since video is a big part of the experience on our on our site. Um, 
about 10% into having 17 years of television on the website. And I think the part that is going well about that is that we're redigitizing and re-encoding it so that for the first time you can see like the popular TV series on your iPhone or your iPad. It's not a mobile website, but or an app. It's just you know the video works on the PC or Mac or you know whatever your device is in your library. Um, so, um, but on the other side of video, I think one of the things that frustrates me is the convergence of um, uh, internet video on a television set. Um, I think the methods of hooking up, watching video, I mean, internet video on a TV are getting better, but it still feels like it's, it's really not simple. And it's going to be different in a year or two years for sure. But um, I think today is a little bit off from when if you were to watch an internet video on a television set, it's like you were having an experience with your iPhone. It's really not at the iPhone place yet uh, with regard to internet video. And I can't wait for the day that, that we are there. Come to our panel in June. We'll be talking yeah, all about it. I really, really, it was I had no idea. But I will come. I think that, that comes down to, you know, corporate deals more than it comes down to the, the technology. I mean, um, you know, almost every TV being released now has internet connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really about the interface. It's about who controls what shows up on the TV screen. You know, it's am I going to turn on my Wii and go watch Netflix, or am I going to turn on my cable and whatever they're giving me on demand is what I get. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so it's still so divided by by whoever's curating your entertainment experience. And I think I think that's that's what's doing it more than the technology. But but you're right. Right now, in order for me to watch anything that I want, mm -hmm. I have to connect to my computer or my iPad to my TV. I, I guess I'm going to be the hater in the group. Go for it, Brian. Please, do it. It's, uh, I haven't, there's a lot of admirable things going on right now, but I haven't seen anything truly disruptive or innovative in quite a while. I think we're on the cusp. We're going to see some pretty amazing things over the, the, up, the next few years. Some really, really amazing things. In what, but, what big buckets? Can you buckify any of oh, quite the right uh, input? I think you're going to see some really, really relevant, simple, useful, amazing, mind-boggling disruptive tools in the digital space. Uh, I think augmented reality is one thing that's going to be coming in. Right now, a lot of people are like, eh, what? But you, you know, the, this stuff is going to be coming out down the pipeline really soon. It's, it, it, for you, especially in your, in your world, the renovation world, uh, is going to be pretty amazing, to see, especially with tablet devices. Uh, that, uh, being able to hold up a tablet Put a code on a window, and then take the tablet and say, "Well, there's my new codes in my window. I want this color. Oh, how much light comes in through the window if I close them or open them? I want this color. Order it now. Shipped overnight. Thank you." There's going to be some pretty interesting things coming down the, the, the pipeline. I think with game layer mechanics and social, we're we're just beginning. We're just starting to see stuff. Uh, that there's going to be some really really interesting things going on with game layer mechanics. But I had the opposite experience with the, that you did at South by Southwest. I thought 99% of the stuff I saw was admirable and, you know, nice bong hit looking. Uh, <laughs> I completely agree. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of. I think long and hard about that one. Anybody else saw this one? They sent me the questions in advance, but I did my homework. I was like, all right. There's a, a lot of spaghetti beans going up on the wall right now, and a few noodles are going to stick. And that. So there's a lot of noise going on. There's a lot of noise. What do you think is holding back some of that stuff? Is it? Is, it's not the creative process. Yeah, it's a process. It, 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 you know, trial and error, right? You just don't ever come out of the gate. Facebook didn't just come. It, 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 it takes time. It, it takes time. So it's a trial and error. It's a trial and error. But uh, you know, it's something that people have really incorporated in their life is innovative technology. The Google TV, I'm sorry, it blows. It's got a long way to go. Long way to go. Uh, there's, uh, there's, look, look, it's going to be awesome. Give it a couple more years, right? <laughs> it's going to be pretty, pretty amazing. And, and as marketers, think about the way that consumers are going to be able to watch an episode of Law and Order and say, I love that color of that courthouse wall. Thank you, Sherman Williams. I mean, it's going to get, it's going to get really, big. it is going to be uh, pretty intense. I'm just curious how much of that that growth is stunted by the whole thing of rights. 
but I had a friend who was working with trying to quote unquote kill people building with like uh, Netflix with if you like this movie, you'll like this movie and whatnot. And he really said that, you know, so hard with like MGM and whatnot because of what happened with Napster that everybody was terrified of losing the rights to the music and that the music industry never really fully recovered from what happened with Napster. So how much is that blocked by, okay, I've got a great idea, but now I need to get this whole group of people to allow me to have the rights to what they have already. I mean, like TV, I mean, how much is the broadcasting blocking Google and saying, I don't know, uh, NBC, I, we want our own station, why should I stand with the people that we need to do that? I think the hackers that are really going to be able to solve that problem, we'll see what it is. I, I don't, I don't really, because the the people that I know that have truly changed the game, you know, they've they've gone out there basically saying, hey, you know, if we get sued, we'll get a lot of publicity, and then maybe somebody will finance and fund us, since you know we've been having so much trouble with VCs. Like, I I think that that the true, you know, renegades who can, you know, code the hell out of anything and and really solve those problems, I, I don't know that they're really that worried about rights. I mean. The people that run their companies in an effective way are worried about it. But <laughs> actually build it, I mean, if they have that hunger inside them, they're just going to go do it. And that's happening all over the place, which is exciting. It's just total chaos right now. It's not being consolidated into effective businesses yet. It's interesting you brought up the music industry because they've been crippled. I mean, yeah. they've been crippled. Uh, they, the, and the entertainment industry is now following suit. They're like, oh, hold on a minute. We have to be very, very careful here. Uh, the, there's going to be significant changes with innovation in, in entertainment distribution, not just music, but with videos, with audio, with gaming, etc. Uh, that p brands now realize more than ever that consumers own the brand conversation. They own that content, whether the brand likes it or not. Whether you're a musician, or, and especially now with the advent of phones, with video, you cannot stop bootlegging. You just cannot. You cannot stop file sharing, and they realize this. And they're scrambling like crazy right now. And, and to your point, people they rule the roost. So how many how many people do you know that have downloaded an illegal movie or or song, or how many people have done it themselves? It's it's becoming ubiquitous. It's part of the nature, and it, it becomes very very scary too because there becomes this everything is free type of uh, I am entitled to free stuff you now. As a musician myself, who played, played professionally for 20 years, I'm like, it's really expensive to do, be a musician. It really, really is, and you don't get paid anything on top of it anyway. And if you're an actor, <laughs> you're struggling to an actor or a poet or a dancer. It's tough. It's really, really tough. So there needs to be a, a fine balance of giving and getting. And uh, there needs to be that two-way value exchange for the brand, whether it's an entertainer, uh, uh, the network, uh, and, and the consumer, right? And I think they're really struggling to figure that out right now. The brands are also kind of clamoring, though, to get on board with the new technologies and kind of be part of that conversation. So you don't have some of the that Napster problem because the brands see the value in being part of the technology and part of the conversation it's now. So yeah, they, they are like, please give me this new technology and how can we play with it and how can we be part of it? Yeah, I mean, they are and they aren't. I, you know, I helped NBC launch their digital studio in 2005 and, and so you know, it, was, it was like, yeah, no, of course, it always depends on the brands by all means. But, I, you know, I think that um, they're still all really trying to hold on to their piece of the pie. And, and what they've done with Hulu is brilliant, but they don't even own you know, all of Hulu. That's a joint venture between three or is it four like major <laughs> entertainment corporations now. You know, and, and Hulu's actually doing really well. It's it's amazing. It actually completely surprised me. But but you know, they're they're moving slowly and cautiously and and they don't want to have happen to them what happened to music. Um, and and I don't think they're really at risk of it at this point because you know, they've been able to kind of keep it locked down and, and learn from those mistakes. But, you know, I think that they they want to embrace the technology, but at the same time, they want to do it in a way that's going to make them the same revenues that they're making on air and or in theaters. And and that's just not realistic. And so the the real challenge now I think is is getting 
entertainment companies specifically, but corporations in general, to, to understand that they're going to have to change their business models and be a bit more nimble. And, and they do have to embrace these technologies, but they have to do it just with, with an innovative business structure too. It's not just porting. You know, it's, it's as bad as taking your 30 second spot and putting it in your online video player. You never want to do that. <laughs> just like that, you want to take your, your offline business model and port it over to your online business model. It just doesn't make sense. I, I so underline that. It, I mean, I've been, been in situations where we were doing some new technology deal and the partner would give me a contract and it was a contract made for when, um, I don't know, it was book rights or something. And I'm trying to see a contract that has to do with something like that and, and make it related to the online world. It's like, just start from scratch. It's, it can be so a wasteful of time to try to um, go from an old media model to a new media model because something as specific as, you know, a contract. So, you have to really think through your models. Yeah, well, well, give, um, well uh, a bad execution, I don't think, really create a creative idea. But how often are you watching YouTube and you get that little bar of ad that comes up? Do you ever click that ad? I mean, the first thing I do is, you know, click it away. And it's kind of, the, uh, the, the Hulu model is, you can watch this long ad, then no more ads, or you can watch the regular things that are interspersed. I just click the long ad, walk away, come back in a minute. It's a fail. The advertising thinks, oh, these people are really engaging, but I don't fail. They just, oh, I'll click this, walk away, come back, and I watch the show, an ad. So that begs, what are the new revenue models? How can they, you know, see them in that is not annoying the user? Because the, once the user gets annoyed, then they're going to drop the product. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to drop YouTube because it's uh, yeah. ubiquitous. Because you, you are making me think about something back to your earlier question of innovation mm -hmm. that's working well. One of the things that personally I like a little bit advertising is when, like on Hulu other places, it says, is this ad relevant to you? Now, I know exactly what the score is. I'm going to some database and they're analyzing me and they're kind of figuring out how to serve me better ads. But I feel this perverse delight in saying, no, <laughs> no, no again. And so it, it actually, I don't know, I don't call it innovation. They do it on Facebook too. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's kind of working. And that creative process isn't working. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the, the YouTube ads that are doing incredibly well are related to music, interesting. <coughs> you know, they're, they're finding, yeah, I mean, they're, they're driving people to the Amazon Music Store or iTunes to buy that song. And, and I mean, record labels are making some, you know, significant revenue that they wouldn't have otherwise through that. You know, and, and instead of forcing users to take down their, their videos that are using those songs, they're starting to place ads on them. And, and it's, I mean, that, that wedding video, you know, the, the Chris Brown, wedding video thing. I mean, the case study on that, YouTube has a whole case study on their site dedicated to that wedding video. And it's pretty incredible. If you want to go like see how this stuff can actually work, I mean, they, they made, like this, this song had a complete resurgence. You know, it wasn't a popular single or anything at that time. And, and they sold like, I don't, I don't remember the number, but they sold a lot of tracks, you know, based on that wedding video that blew up. So I think if it's, again, relevant, Contextualized, then it, it can be powerful. The Shazam one in the old media was uh, quite interesting to see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, the revenue generation. Sorry. The, the, the revenue generation that they're looking for right now, the experiments that are going on, such as, for instance, the New York Times, which you used to have to be able to download on your iPhone and read free, now you have to pay for it. The Daily. They're keeping, the Daily is keeping their, their cards really close to their chest. Everybody's dying. To get uh, to get numbers, how are you doing? How many subscriptions? What's the penetration rate? They're not linking anything right now. And uh, the Times just went to a pay model uh, just a few weeks ago, so it'd be really interesting. I mean, just speaking for myself, I always check it first thing in the morning. I update it on the train ride. I'd read it for a few minutes. Now it's gone away. The dodo bird for me. Now I'm using Pulse. And you look at other other things such as Pulse Reader. They used to just scrape and aggregate and not have uh, advertisements, even they buckle. Right? They're, they're, they're pulling in the name advertisements now, so you don't have to pay for it. But, uh, and the rights history is involved with that as well. But it'll be really, really interesting to see what's going to work. But everybody remember when Hulu went to pay subscription, it was like, oh, there you go. You buy Hulu, nice knowing you. But with the economy, with how many people here have thought about it? If you haven't done it, how many of you thought about cutting your cable cord? Right. We've all, you have Netflix, you have Hulu, you have, hold on a minute, YouTube, 
There are so many options. You're like, well, I'm paying what, two hundred dollars a month just for my freaking cable. Are you serious? <laughs> So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see what, what plays out. I think you guys are all touching on a point that I've been thinking about for the last half an hour is how do you use the necessary legal the data that comes in being creative people? And that's, it's, it's one of those things that you're like, ah, the data, the data. But it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things now that everyone, it's no longer just the retail space. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's across every industry now. Analytics is huge. Just like digital is growing, analytics is growing just as fast. How do you all incorporate the data to say, I don't want to stifle my creativity or my team, but this is what the numbers are showing us. How do you kind of meld the two together to say, this is the best thing, and this is the best way to get engaged for the reasons or, or those kinds of things? How does the data come into play? Daily and critical. Uh, and to me, it doesn't feel like a great thing at all. I feel like it's a helpful. Kind of guidepost to consumer insight and to prioritizing things. I, I make the analogy that if, if you have your ski, you plant your pole and it, it kind of helps you and stabilizes you and gets you going in the right direction. Um, so, so specifically, I'll look at our keyword report. What keywords are people using to we're using Google Analytics now? So you know, it's an obvious what, what, what keywords are drawing people to our site. And from that point, I can think about, oh, you know, I could develop these franchises in this way in terms of our editorial content, or I can do this to adjust my uh, search engine marketing campaign. So it, it's a jumping off point for me. Um, otherwise, it's just a sea of directions to go and things to try. The data helps me kind of start to bucketize what's most important and maybe a little bit less important to do. That's how I approach the data, at least. And our, our common sources are Google Analytics, um, we use uh, Comscore, um, in terms of like site analytics, those are probably our two biggest sources of information. Uh, we, oh, the other source that I love is Bitly Links. We um, use Bitly to shorten our links that are in a lot of our, <coughs> and so it's really fascinating to see what people are clicking on and what, what hasn't been so popular. So data, I love data. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I try to put it in phase one of the projects along with, you know, that strategy and, and sort of the creative development. I, just like picking the wrong tactics when you don't know what your objectives are, you, you can, if you, if you say, all right, we're going to just, you know, use this listening platform, you're, you're probably not going to get what you need. And, and I think that you have, to, you have to think really carefully about, again, what your objectives are for that that project, and, and that will help you hone in on specifically what do we need to pay attention to, because there's so much data. I mean, you can listen to everything if you want, um, but I think that there's actually a lot of creativity happening in the analytics sphere um, because there are so many ways to listen and, and so many um, different nuances, uh, different filters to put, put all that information through. Um, how do you contextualize it and make it matter to your goals? I'm really, really glad you asked that question because I've been waiting to talk about it. It's, it's so important, and, and it, uh, I find that most digital creators are really, really embracing it. And it's, it's the opposite of what it was a few years ago. It's basically, hold on, you, you're telling me that if I do this, I'm going to be, my what I'm creating is going to be better. It's going to be more successful. And and uh, at G2, we've created a PDJ, a purchase decision journey, which. We use this very similar, we sit up front, we do a lot of analytics and strategic insights into what are the consumers doing now that, we, that we're owning in on, or a user, let's say, not necessarily a, a, a consumer. Uh, but it's part of, it's part of the entire process. And it's the define, and listen, we do research, analytics, what's going on within our target market audience. Then we, cr we take that and we synthesize it into a creative mm -hmm. brief, we get the clients we do key stakeholder interviews, we create a creative brief, and then we design, right? So we have to define the design, and then we build. And it used to be you build it, you launch it, you leave it. And then it's all about optimization. It always needs to have uh, that old door open so that we can use data analytics.